All right. Thank you so much for uh, coming. I, I'm just, I know I tell you this every time, but it, it never fails me every time that I'm so thrilled when I see people hungry for the word enough to come for a Bible study outside of church. church just going to church, that's like spiritual weight watchers. You guys are like the spiritual gourmets here, so I think that's, I think that's wonderful that you come. I think uh, we're, we're getting a late start today. So maybe we'll just try to do half of this, and we'll try to do the other half um, next week. Because we're not on a real strict schedule here Sunday mornings with with the Adult Sunday School. Um, shall we have an opening word of prayer? Well, Lord, each one of us relates to you as an individual, as we say in the creeds, I believe, because no one can believe for us. We know that you have no grandchildren, only sons and daughters. So we thank you that you have brought us into relationship with Jesus Christ. But we are not alone, and we recognize that you have called us to be part of your church, your holy Christian church. We thank you, Lord, that you have given us these brothers and sisters, that you've given us callings and vocations, you've given us opportunities to, to grow in the church, you've given us a, a mission to reach the world. We thank you, Lord, that you have done these things for us. We ask for your help as we seek to execute them, and above all, that Christ will be honored and, and glorified in our lives and in our life together. In your son's name we pray. Amen. All right, so we're going through the Apostles' Creed, taking it kind of phrase by phrase. The, the two passages we have today are the Holy Christian Church and the Communion of Saints. I believe in the Holy Christian Church, the Communion of Saints. Now when we use the word church, we have to remember, first of all, that we use that in different senses, right? Um, we could talk about the church. I, I can tell my what I'm running up to the church to eat some candy in my office or something. Right there. <laughs> what do I mean by that? I mean the building. Or I could say, oh, Peter, you and I are the voting members for uh, the... Uh, the election of officers now for the church. What do I mean by that? We're talking about, there it's the denomination, right? The, the big election is coming up here this summer, and he, he and I will make those, make those votes. Um, or we could say, you know, I, I think the church today doesn't put as much emphasis on missions as it should. What do I mean in a state sentence like that? Church on the whole. Kind of talking about the church broadly speaking, like Christians um, in in general. Um, or if somebody says, "Oh, Chaplain Oswald, and I haven't seen you in in years. What are you doing with yourself?" You know, I'd say, "Oh, I'm pastoring a church. What do I mean by that?" Congregation. The local congregation here, right? At Lutheran Church. So we use it in different senses. Um, but what we want to focus on here is when we confess in the Apostles' Creed, I believe in the Holy Christian Church, what is it that we're, we're saying there? So what we're talking about are all believers, all, everybody in the world who trusts in Jesus Christ and the promises of Christ for their salvation, um, they are made part of the same church. Let's look up John chapter 10. Gospel of John, chapter 10. Is there a volunteer who would read verse 16? <clears throat> and I have others, sheep, that are not of this fold, and must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. All right, so how many flocks are there? One. One flock, right. Everybody who listens to Jesus' voice, everyone who hears the, the good news from him, everyone who believes on him, is made part of this flock. There is only one church. Um, 
Jesus also envisioned only one church. Let's go back to uh, Matthew chapter 16. Matthew 16. And is there a volunteer who would read chapter 16, verse 18? And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. All right, so Christ is promising to build his church on the, the rock. Um, so how many churches is he going to build? One. Just just one. And whose is it? His. It's, it's his, right? Um, and while you're there, just skip over to chapter 18, verse 17. <coughs> is there a volunteer who would read that? If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax Okay, so this is in the section where Jesus is describing what you should do if somebody sins against you you go tell them their fault privately and if they don't listen you bring one or two with you and if they still don't listen you go and tell it to the church if they still don't listen then they're excommunicated treat them like a tax collector um, but here he envisions the the church now very interestingly I I might be wrong but I'm pretty sure these two passages that we just read from Matthew 16 and Matthew 18 are the only places in the Gospels where the word church is mentioned. So in the, the, the church is mentioned a lot in the, the epistles later on in the New Testament. But in the Gospels, the stories of Jesus, it's only mentioned here twice. So if you're a liberal theologian or you have a liberal view of the development of Scripture or a low view of Scripture, the way you explain that is Jesus didn't really have a concept of the church. He was just doing his thing. But once the church formed after Jesus ascended into heaven and Pentecost came and the church started to get together, they read back into the stories of Jesus things pertaining to themselves. So Matthew was writing to the Matthean Math Math community or a church of people that Matthew was kind of the pastor of, I guess. And so Matthew just told the stories about Jesus and wrote them in such a way that would uh, help get his point across. Uh, do, you, do you kind of see how that works? So if this was like the past, if this was like the church of Tim Oswald, I would make up a story of Jesus or take a story of Jesus and twist it and change it to say to you what I want you to do. Uh, you know, stop stop wearing uh, green socks or whatever, you know, I don't know, whatever it is. Um, that member was looking at their socks. <laughs> um, um, now, what's the problem with that view? It's, First of all, were, were the languages the same in the epistles and the word church, was that the same word in the well, epistles and, and in, 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 in Matthew here? As they have come to us, yeah, as Matthew wrote it, he's writing in Koine Greek, the rest of the New Testament's in Koine Greek. Now Jesus maybe spoke, probably spoke it in Aramaic, so somebody's having to translate what he, what he said there. Um, but here, here's the point I'm getting at. Oh, go, oh, go ahead, Jim. Well, it's not the word of God, but God is good Yes. It's a, it's a low, low view of Scripture. In other words, if, if Matthew or any of the writers of the Bible twisted and changed things to make it say what they wanted to say, then what have we done to the doctrine of inspiration? It's no longer what the Holy Spirit led them to say or it's inspired them to say. Um, so it's a it's a it's a low view of scripture. So I mean, if you want to argue about it over a cup of coffee and get your doctorate and write a big thesis on it or something like that, you know, that's great. But for those of us that believe that the Bible is the word of God, that it's without error, that it's as God intended it to be, that Matthew wrote the words God intended for him to write, then we have to say no. Gee, this was this was 
a, 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 a fair representation of what Jesus was trying to say. And what would that mean then? It means that even though he didn't have a, it's not a prominent thing, it's not all over the place, even though it's just a couple times, even Jesus had a concept or an idea of what the church was going to be after he was gone. He saw that uh, ahead of time. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Now, when we talk about the church, um, we use two phrases, my confirmands. This would be a good question for my confirmands who are, I, I don't see them here. Um, we talk about the difference between the invisible church and the visible church. So we won't get to the visible church as much today, I think, but uh, the invisible church, what is it? Why do we call it invisible? What is the invisible church? Is it the believers that are no longer present with us? N no, that's a, very, that's a good guess. So the, the believers who have died and gone on, we would call that the church triumphant so we make the distinction between the church militant militant because we're still fighting right we're still we're, we're still at war here while we're on this earth but when you've died and gone to heaven you're part of the church triumphant your battles are over you're at rest you're at, okay. you're at peace so we make that distinction but the distinction here between the church visible and the church invisible what do we mean by that i saw two hands you want paul you want to... yeah i choked on this in 1965 for my confirmation <laughs> i gave the answer and i said flip it the invisible church is that only god knows whose heart you know that they are truly christian i mean we don't know by looking at each other yes so, I yeah i hope you all heard that so who belongs to Christ's church in reality? Those who have true and genuine faith in Christ. And so all of those people everywhere in the world who have faith in Christ are Christ's church. And we call it invisible because we can't identify it with anything that we can see on earth. As much as I'd love to say, it's the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. <laughs> but there are there hypocrites and people who don't believe in the Missouri Synod? Yeah. <coughs> are there people who truly do believe, but they are in another church somewhere? A heterodox church? Yes. Um, so you can't, I, you can't look at any institution or organization or any visible Thing on earth and say that's the church um, the invisible church is made up of all people as Paul said who uh, in their hearts believe let's look up Luke chapter 17 Luke 17 Would somebody read verses 20 and 21? Being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them, The kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed. Nor will they say, Look, here it is, or there. For behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. All right. So you can't see something that you can identify visibly as the, the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is within you, it's in, the, in the midst of you. Um, now, I think we have a pretty good idea, don't we? I, I, my, my pastor many years ago told me something that I, I, it has proven to be right in all my years of ministry. It's a lot easier to say who is saved than who isn't saved. There's a lot of people you can just, I look at your lives, I look at your profession, I look at who you are, and I say, um, yeah, that, that woman, she's a Christian. She's a godly. Now, do I really know that for sure, 100%? Now, you can't really, because you can't see in someone's heart, but I'm, I'm pretty sure. Um, it's a lot harder to say who isn't saved, right? So somebody calls and wants to do a funeral here at the church, but. Pastor, is this not a, a, a common thing? And they haven't maybe been to church in 20 years, and their spouse says, oh, oh yeah, you know, uh, 
he, he believed, he was a believer, he just didn't believe in going to church and he didn't, hadn't taken the sacrament in 20 years and never read the Bible and never prayed. Did he really trust in Christ? I, I, you you yeah. can't say for sure no, right? Um, but it's a lot harder to say it. So it's a lot harder to say who isn't saved than, than who is saved. But these are things that only the Lord knows. It's, it's what's within us. I, I, I was just say in those kind of situations, I would just simply preach Christ. Yeah, that's Christ what we should do. That's exactly you know, what we should do. I couldn't do. say that, you know. Right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I, I feel very comfortable with, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to rush you off to the grave, Peter. <laughs> but I'll probably die long before you will. But if, if I was doing your funeral, I, I would say, he is with the Lord, you know. Thanks be to God. And I feel very confident about it. But there's probably, you know, other folks out there in society. I, the, the best thing is just to talk about Christ and avoid saying they're in heaven now. Because um, we don't know. You can say they're loved by God. Yeah. That's all right. Right. You know, but you can say right. more than that. Let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Would somebody read verse 19? <laughs> but God's firm foundation stands, bearing this seal. The Lord knows who... The Lord knows those who are His, and let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. So who knows who has true faith and who belongs to God? Who's the only one that knows? The Lord. The Lord, the Lord, the Lord knows. Great. Um, all right, we call it one holy Christian church. Why do we call it holy? Let's go to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians. Chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Oh, now it's getting really warm in here. Yeah. <laughs> let's, let's turn it down. Oh, thank you, Jim. Thank you. All right. Would someone, someone read verses 25 to 27? These are in the, the instructions for uh, men and women in marriage. What are the roles? I just did this verse with uh, in some pre-marriage counseling with someone the other day. Uh, so verses 25 to 27. Husband, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself as splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish. All right, I love this analogy here. Christ and, and the church being analogous to the husband and the wife in, in marriage. Um, so husbands are to love their wives the way Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. I mentioned that in my sermon today, right? Mm -hmm. Wherever you see the love of Christ, it's, it's, it's not just this generic amorphous emotional love it's always attached to what he did for the church how did he love us he gave himself up for her why to do what that he might sanctify her when you sanctify someone what what's another what, what's another way of saying that sanctifying someone is setting them apart setting them apart or set it being set apart we even have a special word for that being set apart Making them holy. holy that's it. Mm -hmm. So um, he he gave his life so that he could make us holy. holy. How did he make us holy? Having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. How does he make us holy? Baptism. Through holy baptism. Right. The cleansing of the sacrament. The the water with the word. With the promise of God that washes away our sins. Verse 7, why? So that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy. So Christ's church, what do we know about her? 
she's holy. She's set apart. She's pure. Um, she's cleansed from all the dirt and filth of the of the world. Um, now, does that happen right away? Are all of us in this room um, perfectly holy? Yes and no. That's tricky, isn't it? Um, you're not in the sense that you still actually sin. Well, I shouldn't say you. I'll just say me. Because I, I, I don't know about you all, but I know about me. And I know Dawn a little bit because she lives with me. <laughs> I'm teasing you, sweetie. She's, uh, I don't want her to start talking because she'll testify about me. <laughs> and I'll really be in trouble. Um, so we're in the process of being made holy. The Holy Spirit is working on us, changing us so that we become more and more transformed into the likeness of Christ. So uh, that's the no part. We're not holy. We're being made holy. But the yes, we are holy. In what sense do I mean that? How are we? How, are, how can he say we are holy? Through Jesus. Through, that's it, exactly. Can we're through the, through the work of Jesus Christ. We usually talk about that as justification. That our, we're justified in the sight of God. Our sins don't count against us. But um, sanctification and justification here have this huge overlap. So when your sins don't count against you, what are you? You're holy. You have no sin. You're, you're pure in the sight of God. You, you are that already. We're saint and sinner at the same time. That's, that's the Lutheran way to say it, isn't it? We are simul justus et peccator. We're saints, meaning we're holy, and sinners at the same time. You drew the diagram of it on the board behind you previously. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. So, if, if there's only one church, and if the church is holy, next question, why do we have so many churches? Why, why, are, there, why are there 290 denominations in the United States? Not to mention a half a million independent non-denominational churches, which basically are all denominations under themselves. Each one of them has to form their own denomination, right? Because they have to be something. Um, why do we have all these churches? And even within the churches that confess the same doctrine, like the Lutheran church, why are we always like picking on each other or nagging on each other? Why, why do we have so many fights and so many splits? I remember an old, old pastor one time, he, he, he said, the, the Lutheran church, misery city. <laughs> um, why, why is that? Well, we can see. While we're in Ephesians, go to chapter 4. Chapter 4. You tell us, Paisley. There you go. All right, let me start. I'm going to read this. I'll start because I'll probably make some comments through until we run out of time here. That's okay. Um, I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, as Paul writing to the Ephesian church, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now, do you see what's happening there? Um, he says, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit. Now, in order to maintain something, what do you first have to have? You have to have the thing, right. To, to maintain your house, you have to have a house. To maintain your car, you have to have a car. To maintain the unity of the Spirit, what do you have to have? Unity of the Spirit. So that is a gift. When you are baptized into the Holy Christian Church and you're made a, a Christian, you God gives you unity intrinsically. You are spiritually at one with all other Christians all around you and all around the world. But then he says here you have to maintain it. What does that mean? What does that imply? It means it can deteriorate if, there, if you're not living certain ways, right? If you're not doing certain things to, to sustain and keep it going. Um, how, how do you maintain it? What are the things that threaten it? Well, 
how we how we live and treat one another. So the, the, these first admonitions here in the early verses are how we should walk in our Christian life, how we should live with all humility and gentleness. So, um, suppose we have somebody in the church that instead of humility, they're very prideful. And suppose we have someone in the church who instead of gentleness is like a bull in the china shop. Um, you know, so you walk into church and, uh, oh, Peter Voigt, I see you, even though you're an elder, you didn't uh, wear the liturgical colors today. What's the matter with you? <laughs> right? That, that stuff kind of grates on us, right? Wears us down. We should be humble and gentle with one another. Um, with patience. Um, so, so we have somebody who's not very gentle in the church. And instead of bearing with it patiently, every time I hear him, I'm going, that guy, he's driving me crazy. I can't stand him. I mean, why doesn't he learn to shut up? What, what, what? Who, who talks like that in a, instead of being patient? Ah, the Lord is working with him just like he's working with me. Um, bearing with one another in love. What does bearing with someone in love mean? Well, if you have to bear with somebody, what what is that what does that entail? Um, put up with them. That, that's exactly the words I was thinking. Put, you're putting up with them, right? Um, yeah, Corinthians says, "Suffereth long and is kind." Yeah, yeah, very very good. So I, I, I can use my wife as an example because. <laughs> <laughs> so we've been married for thirty um, thirty two years and a half. And a half. <laughs> And, yeah, and she'll come in the kitchen, and there'll be a bowl of something dried up on the side there. And she'll say, you know, it's my pet peeve that you don't rinse out your dishes. And uh, you know how long she's been telling me that? <laughs> now, I do better than I used to, don't I? 50-50. All right, 50-50. Um, so she lets me know. It's her job to let me know. That's why God gave me a, 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 a wife. Your hus husband and wife should correct each other on things. But she does it gently, right? She doesn't come in and go, Do you see this dish? Do you not know I have told you 150,000 times to wash this? No, she's very loving and gentle about it. How, how about if we do that in the church, right? When we see somebody that is struggling with something, instead of calling attention to it all the time, instead of going on and on about it we bear with it in uh, in love all right so how we live and treat one another is one of the main reasons why we don't always have unity in the church so there there are two re we're going to get to it next week the second reason why churches are not are divided is because they don't all have the same doctrine we're going to see that in the same passage but one of the reasons churches are divided is because we don't love each other in Christ and you've all seen that in churches right churches that split up because one side wanted green carpet and the other side wanted red carpet and it turned into a battle that that's got nothing to do with doctrine that's how they treat one another I'm, I'm having a senior moment uh, who who were was it John Paul John Mark. Who were the two that split up? Yeah, Paul and Barnabas. Paul and Barnabas, because oh, they said it was better for them to divide into their own churches than to have the contention between the two of them continue. Yes. So I don't know if you can hear that, but he's calling attention in the book of Acts how Paul, who went on missionary journeys with Barnabas, they had a young fellow, John Mark, who had gone with them and then he deserted them. So now John Mark wants to go with them again. And Paul says, I, I don't think we should take him. And Barnabas says, no, of course we should take him. And so Paul and Barnabas split up. Now, it's interesting because there's another passage in one of the epistles later written where evidently at some point Paul was reconciled to John Mark. And, and if it's the same person, they, they, they made up about it. But at that time, even Paul ends up having a split. Mm -hmm. So um, Sometimes, sometimes it, it's for the sake of peace. Yeah. Well, although that's not, that, that wouldn't be God's way, right? Well, no, but... To split up just, just to avoid, but yeah. that's true, it's because we're sinners. Ba Baptist church, Lutherans have done this, you know, all our lives, but Baptists do it worse than us. 
Did you ever hear somebody say that the favorite verse of Baptists is uh, from Genesis, where Abraham is talking to Lot, and he says, you choose the way you, will, you want to go, and I will go the other way. <laughs> I don't mean to tease him. Uh, but how many churches end up splitting over things that aren't related to, to doctrine? That is what harms the unity of the church. All right, next week when we come together, we'll look at um, the, the other thing that harms unity and oneness in the church. Um, so we're, I can't really see the clock, it's clear, but I'm pretty sure we're past our time. So uh, thank you all for being here. I hope this is encouraging and um, helpful to you and that you'll come again next week. Um, shall we close with the doxology together? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Thanks, everybody.